Hello, legends and super legends. Welcome to Vela Harmony Live. Uh, we had to move the session one hour later. Just a crazy day for Fitz. Um, in fact, I just got an email from one of our super legends, uh, Jamal Griffith. I did his remote fit today. We've revamped the remote fit process to where it's no longer done via email. We basically do a live session. And <laughs> it was very successful. We got him dialed in and he looks really, really smooth. And the way I do the fit is I explain everything. So he's really thrilled. I just got a couple of emails from him right before I started this session here. He says, uh, today's experiment was fantastic. I can't wait to get on my bike again. Cause he was uncomfortable. He was having knee pains and different things. He had had a local fit where he lives. And he told the guy about it and the guy said, hey, your shoe's tight. Well, he loosened the shoes and the, the foot was still going to sleep. It turns out his saddle was about three and a half centimeters too high. And so I sent him his remote fit numbers and everything after we're done, because I pretty much document everything. He said, I was working on my review when your email came in. I'll be sure to follow up with you on the effect of the changes for you to share. Yeah, and that's what I'm talking. He said, feel free to share with the community. Um, I decided to revamp the remote process because I started getting more requests for more remote fit. And it was taking up too much time to do it by email while I'm typing a text to tell people what to do. And now I will no longer do that. I'm doing it via, there's an app called Discord that Patreon gave access because I'm on Patreon. And it's something that I rolled out to the different tier, the people who are on Patreon, you have access to where we can do video chats or chat based on what level you're at. When you have questions, private sessions can be held. And I believe Andre is already on there. I sent him a friend request because I saw him on there. So those of you who are patrons on Patreon, try to uh, get the, Disc the Discord app. If you're having problems, I can actually send you an invitation so that you can get on Discord. It's really easy to do. It works on PCs, Android, iPhones, whatever. And it's, it's great because you can chat by text. You can listen in like here. I can do live streams and different things through there. And down the road, we'll, I'll look into that. But it will, it will give you the opportunity when you're on Patreon. Like if you have questions with something going on with you, we can set an appointment and be able to do a video chat or text chat or whatever. And what's available is based on the tier level you are. And so instead of me using emails and sending like 20 emails back and forth and people are confused, we did a live video session. And in an hour, 20 minutes, got him dialed in front end his front end was up in the air like that you know i don't know who's installing these stems on road bikes in the u.s pointing up and you know every bike seems to have that way so he had a lot of weight on his hands but we started with the saddle and by me explaining things he really got it so it was really easy to do so i'm going to definitely be doing that so I've, I've sent some things to modify the advertisement for the remote bike fit to put on there and it's going to be live and so it, it really works better. So people who don't have access to a good fitter, you know, like the guy who came here 900 and something miles, anybody who's handy, and I'm going to take pictures of the tools that you will need. I already put the text there, but I'll put the pictures of them there so people can know what tools you have to have to be able to do it. So I just wanted to do that. It was really great working with Jamal. It went well. He looks really good on his bike. You know, he could even uh, do the, 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 the thing where the European pros can lay on the, the bars with their wrists. He can do that. You can't do that if you're not in the saddle. And if your weight's not balanced, it's not comfortable. So as he did that, his cadence just went up. Then, he, then I started to explain to him that when we're going fast, that's what we do. We unload the bars and your cadence just picks up. So it's kind of cool. So that's Eric now. Hey, Eric. Uh, listen, Eric, I have a problem getting this... Uh, you won a jersey last week. You were not here, and I had trouble getting it to you on my end. I will be shipping it this week. You won this jersey. Since you were not here, you won this jersey. You were the, the, the Patreon of the month. So I will be sending it out tomorrow for you. I've pulled your address. I don't know what happened, but uh, just a you know, snafu. So I will get that out to you. I just wanted you to, to give you a heads up. Yeah, I see Paulie Lunga there. Uh, let's see. Ian Hunter, welcome. Jose Castillo, how you doing? Psycho Warrior. Mark, uh, let's see, Daryl. Hey, Daryl. All the legends. Daryl, I also see you on the Discord app. I'm going to start using that more. I see that you're already on there. It says only Shanks. 
So that's good. Uh, Andre is on there as well. So those of you patrons that want to be able to communicate with me on demand, uh, you, it's free. You can just connect to Discord. I've already set up the tiers on Patreon. I think, I don't know how you did it, uh, Daryl, but I don't know if you have to go through Patreon to get in there, but there should be a way. I think it recognizes your name or something. I, I've already connected the Patreon account to Discord. So all the patrons that are there that are eligible will get in the right tiers automatically. It shows you're in there. Andre's in there. Jamal's in there. Jamal connected today. If anybody's having a problem connecting to Discord, send me an email. Let me know. I will send you an invite. And when you accept the invites, you get the app or whatever. I like it because I can use it on the PC. I, I use the PC with my Wi-Fi. And so for an hour and a half, we had a good connection. The volume cut out from time to time, but the picture was perfect. Because on, on Wi-Fi only, like on LTE on your phone, sometimes it drops the packets. And then the pictures will freeze, like with FaceTime. So this is so much better than doing FaceTime. It's almost like Skype on steroids. I really like it. It's a great way to communicate. Um, so they have a lot of other things that will that involves the streaming I got to look into, but I'm starting to use it. Andre has been there for a while, and he, he even put messages, is this being used? And I finally just got around to getting in there. So that's kind of cool. All right, let's see here. So this is a way that if you're having a problem and you're a patron, that's a way we can communicate. We can have private sessions, private messaging, out of video chat, whatever. So it's a really good. It's very easy to use. I like that. So I will be rolling that out. Hey, Robert. Let's see. Abid. The land in the UK. Christopher Roxbury is here. Psycho Warrior. Let's see here. Getting Ready 101 says hi. He said, Eric Nell says, while working on my indoor trainer, I have been doing high cadence intervals, 110 to 120, which is high for me. Yeah, that's high. That's like you're sprinting or you're closing gaps on the flats. For a sprinter type, do you feel that this would provide more benefit than high torque. Both of them have benefits. The high RPMs gives you what we call snap, velocity, closing gaps. There's a time for that. There's a time for torque when you're going up a grade that is going to extend. You don't want to spin too much because you use so much oxygen because all that movement. So, yeah, both of them would benefit you because you have to have strength to be able to spin, spin a reasonably sized gear at those high cadences to get the speed you need. So you need both in your plan. Yeah, Eric, I will get that jersey out to you tomorrow. I've got it here. I'll print out. I got your address and everything. Uh, I found out that these guys do pickups, and so I've been using it. The mail people come here and pick it up. I don't have to drive it to the post office, so it's great. It's more convenient. And so I will do the, um, what do you call it, the priority mail because it's registered. <clears throat> Chris, welcome. So Chris Barron says he went out with the Room Putt Charles Dutch cycle team today who are in the Tour de Yorkshire tomorrow. Their steady ride was 27 miles per hour, average over 40 kilometers. Will you watch the Tour de Yorkshire? I will check it out. I will look on Tiz Cycling. It'll probably be, I've been watching a bunch of the, uh, you know, like Fletch Wallon and other things, other races. I've been watching a few of them. Just the last 30 kilometers is about an hour or so. Yeah, I'll watch it now. Yeah, the, the 27 miles an hour average, that means that the conditions were right. Because even for the pros, that's pretty fast. But those guys are riding probably if you're in a, a if you if it's a team, they're in a pace line, and they're probably in like the 16 and 15 and on the big chain ring, and you know, they can they stay there all day long if the conditions are right. Yeah, that's pretty fast, even for them. So that means you guys didn't have a lot of blustery headwinds or something, and it was relatively flat to maybe one percent. So 25 miles, that's that's pretty good for them. I mean, with those guys do a 40 kilometer time trial. A lot of them average over 30 miles an hour <laughs> you know, at their levels. Chris Rippey, welcome. Yeah, uh, Daryl Shank says uh, Discord sounds like a nice new platform to use. I've just gotten into it because of Patreon. I did not know anything about it. Patreon rolled it out. I set up the connection. I added it as a benefit on the different tiers. 
What I like about it is not only is it easy to use, you can have private messaging at the same time you're having a group thing. So you could click on someone like a friend, right click, and move that person to a private conversation while the group thing is going on. So it has a lot of, of nice features and it appears to be very stable. I used it for the first time today, over an hour, almost 90 minutes with no interruptions. So that was good. I, I think it's better than Skype because it has other things other than just video chat. It has text chatting, video chatting, voice. So you can set up a session to where it will allow you guys to speak like I'm speaking to where I'm not just the only one talking like we're doing here. So they have a lot of things that I need to look into and see how we can leverage that. But right now, what I want to use it for are for the benefits for the patrons, like setting up a one-on-one -on -one live, live video conference with you guys based on the tier you're in. If you're having a problem or you got a question so we can schedule something and be able to communicate with each other without depending on the phone. And that's really what I want to use that for. That's why it's on Patreon. Patreon, Because when you look on Patreon, you will see that based on your tier, you get dropped into a group. And so the group you're in, I think, is not Cubs. You're one level up. Lion Pride or whatever. You have certain features that you can use in there that the people in Cubs can't. You know, So there's a lot of things I'm looking into leveraging that with. All right. Let's see here. Um, a D B. Yeah, the, the Velo Harmony jerseys are scheduled. Chris, Christopher Roxbury just said uh, we'll soon be rocking our new Velo Harmony jerseys. It's scheduled to be delivered around the 28th of May. So when I click on the thing in there, it still says it's in manufacturing. So, yeah, and I'm, I'm excited about that. That should be really cool. Jeffrey, he's still at work. Welcome, Jeffrey. Um, I don't know if 5.30 is better for you guys than 4.30. What, I, what I'm trying to do, I put that schedule out there on the channel page because what I'm trying to accommodate are the guys in the UK and in you know Eastern Europe and other places because they're like GMT plus five and like in France, I think it's GMT plus six or something like that, depending on what we do at our time here. So what I'm trying to do is 4.30 seems to be reasonable because it'll be like, 9.30, 10.30 on that side of the world so they can still sit in for an hour. That's why 4.30 is really good to do for me. And so feel free to provide some feedback, you know, but we're doing 4.30. I had to move it one hour up because today was a busy, busy fit day. And so that's why. But it's there. I mean, it's not going away. We may tweak it back and forth. But that's the reasoning for picking that time. I don't want to just accommodate North America because we have a lot of people across the pond. All right, let's see here. <clears throat> so DJ Fuentes said, hello, talk about drivetrain. Why some cost all that money? <laughs> Welcome to capitalism. This business, man. Uh, drivetrains. Okay, let's see. How do I approach it? Um, by drivetrain, what he's talking about is your crank set, your crank arm. I'm not going to talk about pedals because you usually buy that separately. And then your, your cogs, your cassettes. So depending on, it's up to you, DJ. It, you, you make that choice. That, you know, A lot of the bikes in the store, they don't put fancy drivetrains on there because they want to keep the price reasonable. So a lot of times you might get Shimano 105 you know, because they want to keep that price down. They're not, they're not going to mount... Dura Ace, the top Shimano on the bike, or Campy Super Record on the bike. A lot of times, the bikes that they're stocking would maybe have Ultegra for like Shimano, but a lot of them have 105. Then when you get it, then you can decide whether you want to upgrade. Because if they put the top stuff on there, it would be priced too high, and, and it might not move that many bikes. Now, you don't have to buy the top drivetrain. That's why I laughed when I read your question. It's up to you. So you, you don't have to buy it. Now, I'm not saying they don't ever put bikes that come with the top drivetrain. You're going to come across them. you know. But the shops are the ones ordering the bike. So what they do is they try to get a price range to where they think they can sell that bike. 
So they don't put expensive stuff on there unless you walk in and you building your own. Then you, yeah, you can get pretty crazy. Uh, we we ride with a guy who has, I'm not going to say who, Elong, Paul Elonga knows who I'm talking about, that has the means and he's got a pair of wheels at eight grand for the wheels alone. That's more than my bike. <laughs> that, you know, eight grand for the wheels because he chose to. And, you know, and he can afford it. So, yeah, it's up to you. So don't worry about why they cost that much. They're, they're nice to have, you know, and I will use this analogy. If you can drive, you can drive. If, you, if you're if a driver with great skills, like if you took Jeff Gordon and put him behind a Corolla, he could probably outdrive you in a while you're sitting in a Porsche or a Ferrari because he's just a skilled driver. So the analogy I'm using is, if you're a fast rider, you will be fast on 105. You know, you're not going to go that much faster because you upgrade to Super Record or Dura Ace. I hope that helps. So it's, it's just a, a choice. You don't have to buy the top stuff, but it's nice that it's there. Some people like them, you know. And, I, you know, they're nice. They're nice to have, but, you know, they're, they're not a must have. That's why. So some of them, yeah, they do cost a lot. So you have to shop and decide, decide what you want to spend. And then when you go to look at the bike, ask them, why is this bike so high? And they'll tell you. Just like the guy at the bike shop told me when I asked about the, the kid's bike, I said, why you want $900 for two little girls' first bikes? He said, because of how they're specced. And, and, and in that situation was, they chose not me. They chose to put suspensions. Who puts suspension on a little kid's bike? They're just learning how to ride. So because of those components, they were asking nine times as much as what we paid when we went to Walmart. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, that, that it's great to have those choices. So don't focus on that. Don't focus on that. Just get what is within your means. Start with that. And somebody asked last week, they said, if I had, and I'm paraphrasing this, if I had the option, where do I spend the money? Components or frame? And what I said was, buy the best frame your money can buy, because that's your foundation. You can always change components whenever you feel like it. So don't 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 dwell on that. They, they got crazy stuff out there. I did, I did the example about, imagine two car, a set of carbon wheels, eight grand. So you hit, when you hit something, you start crying. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Uh, uh, so, Chris, yeah, yeah, I uh, I saw I got an a thing off of Twitter, uh, the the team in Ineos, the new kit and the F twelve, the, the paint scheme, it's almost like purple or burgundy kind of color. It looks look good, you know. So they they changed their color. I guess the the new sponsor is taking over. For Chris from Chris Barron saying that the First time Alpha Froome and Pinarola F12 in the team. The bike pretty much looks like the F10. They just have F12 on it with a different format. So who knows? It might be the same bike just rebatched. <laughs> you know? uh, let's see. There was a guy. There was a guy. Um, I don't remember his name. After this week's group ride, he put a comment on the the website on the, on YouTube, and he said that uh, he he was looking at different things. And it was like during during the live session, he's posting a comment, and I guess he he did he wasn't live with us, so I didn't see it in the live live session. And afterwards, I saw it. He asked what kind of camera I was using. I told him GoPro Hero Five, and then he said he's shopping and he's been looking at the six, the seven, or whatever. And what I told him is the five, six, and seven are pretty much all the same camera. They made a few changes that they write about. And chances are you wouldn't even it, it, it wouldn't even be something you will even use, but they call them changes. So what I suggested to him was, and that's, we we have like I have like five replies. He has five, so we have like a string of ten comments. And I just told him, I said, look at the five, six, and seven. Find which one is going for the best price and buy that one because it's the same camera. Because <laughs> the stuff that they've changed in there are so subtle. Now, only the real techies are going to really use those features. That, that's how they get you. They call it planned obsolescence. So don't fall for that. Get what you want, hang on to it, and use it till it falls apart. Then you buy what's out there. 
don't try to keep up with what these guys are doing because every three to three to six months they're coming up with something new. So I saw the F12 and I, I laughed because what's his name? Fabian just had the F10. Why did it go from 10 to 12? I don't know. I guess it went 8 to 10. Okay, so they're going up maybe even numbers. Because, yeah, I think they had an F8. I don't know if there's an F9. So 8, 10, 12. Okay. And it looks the same. You know, so who knows? <laughs> Let's see here. Uh, Chris Rippy says, any thoughts on rotor Q rings? I've never used them. Um, I, I've never really used them. I, I've read up about them, but it's all a matter of you know, I think they're elliptical. I, th I think they are. Let me see. Uh, I've seen the reviews on some of the parameters that come with. Let's see. Here. Rotor Q rings. Yeah. And it looked like it's a bit, almost like an oval. It's, a, it's an unusual shape. You know, you just pretty much have to try them. I mean, if... if if they came on my bike when I used to ride, I'd probably be riding them. I don't know if, if you notice that much of a difference. I, I have seen riders that tried elliptical, some of the, the, the non-circular rings, and then they went back. And then there's some riders that just like them. People have claimed that it helps your pedal smoothness, you know, so there's different things. So it's just a matter of it's a product out there that, you know, I personally would not spec a bike and put that on there. But if I got a deal on a bike and it was on there, then I'd get to try it. Yeah. So, you know, it's just a matter of uh, whether you want to take the chance. And they, they, they look like they make some that are standard as well, or as slightly oval. And they have different kinds. They have like the arrow kinds where it's solid. So they have different kinds of rings on there. And Alan has one on his time trial bike. And it, it looks almost like a regular one, but it, 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 there's a bit of a change at one corner of it. So it's like a spin-off on the, the other ones. <laughs> so Jupin said, it grand for wheels, that's wild. That's not the worst thing I've heard. But, but, but look at it this way. If you have it, what else are you going to do with it? I've made the comment. There's never been a hearse with a Brinks truck behind it. So if you got it, treat yourself. That's the attitude I have. I have no problem in people spending what they can afford to just experience stuff. Because if you get if, if the guy gets tired of it, he can sell that. Somebody would buy it. That's why eBay, I get a lot of stuff off of eBay that people try and they're like, eh, didn't work for me. And so if you can find something, you you get that, you can get that. So it's not so much that it's eight grand, but it's like he outfitted a particular bike and then he put that on there. So overall, the bike ended up being very expensive, but expensive is really relative. You know, so if you if you have the income to support that, then it's not that big a deal. Kind of like the people driving around in their Ferraris to go seven miles to work. <laughs> you know, you don't need a Ferrari to drive seven miles, but They've got the means, so why not treat yourself, you know? And so that, that's not a big deal. I just use that as an example to just say that there are a lot of things out there. You just have to decide what you want to spend your dollars on. But there, there are, there are 8K on wheels alone, that's not bad. There are bikes out there that cost just an obscene amount of money because they're light. And, you know, they're probably even less than the UCI legal limit. The major company, Trek, and those guys, they make them. You don't see them every day because they're not selling large numbers, but there's some crazy stuff out there. So let's see. Eric Nell said, Enzo T, nice 50-mile-an-hour win when it's hitting your bag. was also fun to fight. Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, so Robert wants to know, do I have a sunscreen preference? No, um, I, the one that I use is not oily. That's the biggest. That's the only problem I have. I don't like to feel like there's a lot of oil. When it when in the throes of summer, I do use them because it's like if I'm out there in the heat of the day. But what I do is I try to avoid being out there in the heat of the day. We usually leave early and try to get back around here where we live. 
the heat really kicks in one between one o'clock in the afternoon from one to five. That's the hottest part of the day in summer here. It doesn't mean that noon doesn't feel warm, but the sun is not as intense. So yeah, there are times when I will wear that because um, from time to time I've gotten burned, you know, especially well, it was really like social stuff, not riding a bike, standing around. I went on a cruise one time, was standing around and got burned. But yeah, just get something that's not oily and depending on how much you want, what kind of SPF you want, because you don't want it to be dripping when you sweat. That's the biggest thing. And there are people that are very sensitive to the sun. They have arm screens. I have a pair of arm screens. It's white. It's almost like arm warmers are very light. You know, just let air through. Uh, Paul H. wears ar arm screens in the summer because he burns easily. So he wears that. They do make that if, if you're sensitive. And it's mostly for your arm because your arm's just sitting out there. Your legs are moving, so it's not that bad. But your, your legs still get a tan. You know that. You take off your shorts, you can see the difference. There's a joke where they, 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 they make a joke about the guys in Belgium where they say their legs look bronze, but it's really rust, not a tan, because of all the rain they get. I think Paul Liggett was the one that made a joke. But yeah, just find something that's non-greasy and it will not drip on you. Get the small bottles and try them before you settle on something. I don't really have one because I only use them rare, once in a while. And I got them because my wife got them. I just, it's sitting downstairs. It's really hers. <clears throat> Let's see here. Um, Psycho Warrior says, I know someone who just purchased an F10, financed it. Now he's torqued because the F12 was announced. The bike looks the same. I don't, you know, I don't know why people got to have the latest. You will never have the latest. They change them so often. That, that's why I'm saying they look the same. Who cares if they come up with an F12? If you're happy with what you got, you shouldn't care. That's what I'm saying. Take your time, shop, get what you want, and move on. You can't, you can't keep up with those guys. They're doing the stuff like it's software now. <laughs> I don't know what they're selling the F12 for. Let's see. Let's see what they want for that. I know it's a pretty penny. Let's see. Pinarello F12. Road.cc. Let's see if they'll even list the price. <laughs> uh, they don't even put the price. They got all these articles. <laughs> they don't want you to know. They don't want to give you sticker shock. I'm going to go to RA Cycles. Now, RA Cycles is in the New York area. Uh, the thing about them is take their price and go down a bit because from the other people, their prices are lower. RA Cycles always has a premium on their pricing. So let's see what they have here. Uh, Pinarello, the Ultegra Di2 bike. Well, that's not what I want. That's I want an F12. Dogma, F8, F10. They don't have a 12 yet. So it must have, yeah, it's just been launched. But let me go to the 10. Wow. Okay. So the 10 is about $12,000. That's not obscene because Specialized Venge I was like 14 when I did that video about them. So all these carbon bikes are in that range, 12 grand for a bike. And there's no engine. So I, you know, if you get it, if you know your size and you get them used with somebody who's unhappy with them, you can get a deal. Yeah. So it might be like 15 grand for the F12, probably, depending on what components you put on there and who you get it from. I'm sure they, they just sell the frames too. You know. Yeah, they all those bikes, they're like, you know, they're just trying to see what they can get. But they're nice though. Don't get me wrong. They're very nice. I'd much rather spend more money on my kits. <laughs> that's me. But you know, at some point, yeah, they're, they're nice to have if you can get them. Let's see here. Um uh, Eric says, I have an option of either Continental GP 4000 S2 tires or Vittoria Corsa GT. Do you or anyone on this hangout have any recommendation on which tire is best or experience with either? Well, I've used both. I prefer Vittoria. But I, I need to caution you. The, the 4000 S2 will last longer than the Vittoria if you use them the same. 
but the Victoria really sings. So I use the Victoria for rides I really care about. And in fact, sometimes I love them so much, I just ride them till they're, they're, they're gone. But the 4000 has more life out of it. You know, but the Victorias rise so much better, especially if you use them with latex tubes, which is what I put in them. The Victoria, they're designed for your fastest rides. They call them a racing tire. And Continental with the 4000, they're trying to hedge. They want to get more durability. Victoria has a cotton, it's a cotton-based tire. And just something about it, you hear the thing on the tarmac. They, they talk to you. And this is something about that that I just really like. That's what I'm writing. I'm not writing a G plus. I have the Corsa Evo, but I have my backups the G plus because I couldn't get any Corsa Evo, so I bought a couple of G plus just to have. I ride the 25s and the 23. They don't make a 28 in the Evo, so I have a 25 on the back and a 23 in the front. But I swear by those tires, they're just nice. But they're not for you to train on every day. So you need to have another set. And they use that for your group rides and stuff. They're sweet tires, though. Yeah, you, you're not going to get the longest life out of them. And I, I personally don't care. I want to just enjoy them for as long as they last. You know, but they, they last long enough. But that they're just a better tire. They call them, uh, the, the, I think they're they're Italian. I think they, they refer to them as open open. Uh, uh, tubular. That's what clinchers are generally called, but they they go out of the way and they basically call their tires open tubular. You know, and they, they really ride great. Hey, Steve Goldvig and how you doing? Chris Barron, Vitura Costa are brilliant. They look nice too. Yeah, they just they just ride and even Paulie Longa, when he's riding with me, he can hear my tires. There's something about the, the tread or whatever they do. It just it just it rides so well. I just I can't. It's hard to describe. You got to experience it. So if you've already if you've never ridden the Victoria, then try the Victoria. Because if you've already ridden the four thousand S or whatever the, you know Continental stuff, yeah, the Continental Gator Skin is not even in that class of what we're talking about. The Gator Skin is like an all around just a tough tire, but it doesn't have the best ride. It's not a dog. But the rubber compound is very hard. I use that on my trainer. And I can use it on a the trainer, then go on the road. But when I switch to out of the 4,000 that you're talking about or the Victoria, it's a whole different feel. Something about the compound, it just is grippier. Even the 4,000 is really grippy. The Victoria is not, as, is not as sticky, but when you're cornering, even in the wet, the Victoria has really good traction. So Victoria just seems to have invested more technology in those tires, you know, and I just, they just seem to be in a, a spot of their own, put it that way. And they do have different models. So I'm sure they have some Victorias that it's built to last longer, but you probably won't get that supple ride that you get from the top guys. And if you shop online, you can get a deal on them. Let's see here. Um, Rodolfo, how you doing? Rodolfo. So Joel, Joel, Joel FRO23 said, are you sponsored by Rafa? I discovered you with the Rafa's review you do, and I'm curious. No, you think I sh I would be. Um, recently, when the, in March, Rafa has what is called the industry purchase program, where if you're in the bike industry and you can prove to them that you're in the bike industry, they give you an account that you get a 20% discount off of anything you buy from them at retail. So I signed up early March and then it, it was like the, the program was already ending. So I just reapplied May 1st or April 30th. Actually, I just reapplied. It'll take like seven days. So it lasted like two months because they wanted to get everybody on the same schedule of, you know, the application process. So since I applied at the end of the last program, they only gave me 60 days of it. And so it's nice to buy something and get 20% off. That's about the only thing. No, I'm not sponsored by Rafa. They just make really good stuff. And I just get them. I like them. And I want to share with you guys. That's what it's about. You would think I was sponsored by them, but it wouldn't make a difference if I were. I would, I for one, even if somebody came with a big check and they had crappy products, 
I just I wouldn't do any reviews because it just you know it just be against my nature. Uh, and I, I think I know why you're asking because you can see the enthusiasm when I'm doing the, the reviews. But the reason is because when I used to race, we didn't have all those nice little things. Little things like being able to have that zippered compartment on the side where you can stand your phone up and put it in there. We used to have to use the pockets that we use for carrying food and other things. So those little things that they, they're putting in there, they were not available when I was competing. We had to make do. So I give them their props because they're sitting around just like you and I sit around and thinking about ways to improve their garments. Don't get me wrong, they're pricey, but if you get them on sale, you can save some money. And so, yeah, the, the stuff is just so good that I'm expecting the other guys to step up so I can be excited about their stuff. That's all it is. I found Rafa in 2012 and how I found them was somebody was bashing them online. I went to some forum. I was probably researching something. I ended up at a bike forum, and somebody was saying that they were going to drop. I had talked about it. If they see anybody wearing Rafa, they were going to make sure they dropped the person because they were wearing Rafa. And, you know, so there's a lot of haters. And so I said, well, let me go see why they hate the Rafa stuff. <laughs> and I never looked back. I got to the site, and I was like, man, this stuff is nice. Then the, the, the return policy. I'm just letting you know what got me into Rafa. So I, I saw the hate thing online. I said, oh, let me go check them out, see why these guys hate them. And then I said, oh, you know, that looks interesting after reading about the, it was a protein bib shorts at the time that I tried. And I got them and, and they just worked great. Uh, one of them, I even did a review video where the, the short had, was turning brown. I had worn it for so many years. The Lycra was fading. And one of those I ended up sending back to Rafa and they said they couldn't fix it. So they gave me 50% off of, a replacement one. No other vendor does that. I mean, where are you going to buy clothing, use it for three years, and then say, you know what? This stuff is fading. Can you replace this panel? And they say, well, we can't do that, but if you buy the current one, we'll give you 50% off. Or if you crash, you say, I've used the, if you crash and you tear your jersey, you send it back to them. If they're able to, they'll fix it free for the life of it. Who else is doing that? To return stuff that every time you buy something from Rafa, it comes with a label prepaid FedEx ground. I've got so many of them just sitting in an envelope because they don't expire. So anytime you need a return, you just need a bag and stick the label. Doesn't cost you any money. No one else is doing that. I bought stuff from La Pasilla and they, they sent a color I didn't like. I didn't even open the thing. I sent it back. They charged me a fee. They took it out of the money they returned that I paid for the jersey for the shipping back to them by DHL. So I was like, I can't try their stuff. I'm just giving you a taste of why I got into Rafa. They just go out of their way to do special things. No one else is telling you, don't lie to us, you know, because you know how it is. Uh, you don't want them to know you were racing or whatever. Rafa doesn't care. If you crash, send it back. If they can't fix it, they give you 50% off the comparable replacement or whatever you choose to do. For the life of the garment, no limits. If you if you gain weight, let's say you, you're heavy and you buy extra large, and then you work out within a 12-month period, you had to limit that, and you lose weight, they will take your old jersey that doesn't fit you and give you a discounted price on the replacement. Who else is doing that? They got all these little things that they're doing. I was just like, you know. So this guy that started the company, he's just thinking about things that make you want to do business with them. So yeah, so yeah. No, I'm not sponsored by them, but I'm hoping the rest of the industry steps up and start making garments, you know. They just came out with a, a new, I just got an email. Uh, every time they send an email, I just look at it. I'm like, these guys are getting me in trouble. When I talk to Paul, I always tell him, Rafa's getting me in trouble. They sent a shadow jersey. You guys that saw there was a race, we're talking about uh, Liege, Bastonia Liege. The EF team that they're sponsoring was wearing a, a jacket because it was raining. And it looked like a jersey, just real like a lightweight wind jacket. Turns out it's not a wind jacket. It, it will block the wind, but it's actually a shadow fabric, they call it, the shadow line, which is very expensive. They, they got shadow jersey, shadow shorts, whatever. But anyway, they basically repel water, and that's what those guys were wearing. So they sent an email advertising that, not the EF model, but just for everybody else. 
is like 275 or whatever. So I started to read, and what I liked about it was even though they have the rain cape, this this rain jacket, the shadow one, breathes better, breathes more than that one. Because sometimes the regulation of your temperature is a problem when you ride in the rain, you know, especially here where it's warm. And so I was like, these guys, they so they come up with stuff to where it's so close to another one. You, your challenge is which one do I get? Drives me nuts. <laughs> All right, let's get back here to something else. I kind of got carried away there. Um, let's see. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Daryl Shank, Eldred, any glove recommendations? Finger or fingerless? Didn't realize one pair I had. The pad was in the center palm area near the wrist, causing my hand to sleep. <sighs> yeah, um... I have our our model from Santini, which really you know, it, it works really well. But also, I have gloves from Rafa. Uh, I mean, unless you you want the team glove, which is great. I mean, I use that. That's great. But let me give you a couple of options here. Um, the 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 models that they make. Let's see. They have. Uh, the pro team line is what I like to recommend for people who ride frequently. You know, you don't have to be racing, but the, the, the pro team line seems to, I like the fit. They have these gloves. I think Paul got some, and some of them are on sale now. So I think it'll be a good time for you to jump on it. Let me just do a search here. I'm on their site. Shop men's. So when you go to that site and you go to shop, I like the way they have it lit. Uh, laid out shop men's gloves and mitts. So if you click on gloves and mitts, it takes you straight there. And what I usually do is I just go ahead and select my size. I wear a size large because this is nine. You measure like that around your knuckle, and, and mine's nine. So I wear large in their sizing with Santini and the other guys. I think it's about the same. But anyway, what I do is I look at the size availability because. One thing about Rafa that frustrates me, and even Fabian told Paul Ilonga that he hates shopping online because you find something you like and it says out of stock. So he's like, why is the picture there? So I, the first thing I do is I, I just select everything based on the size. So it can just show me what in my size is available. So I won't see anything. And I think Psycho Warrior does the same thing. It's like you go there first and you just select your size. So I'm not going to see anything that is not available in my size. And then they have pictures of it. So, Daryl, I think that's what you should do. Go to the Rafa. Rafa.cc is the website. And then do shop men's and look for gloves. And then when you get that, have a bunch. And you can, you know, based on what I would suggest is I wouldn't buy anything at regular price because there's no reason. They're all pretty good. Because these, these, these are fitted for cycling. Um, let's see what they have on sale. I always look for sales. I don't really see anything here, but um, the Pro Team Mitts is the one they have, which is brand new and is at regular price. That fits really well. But uh, let's see. I will send you. Um, I don't know if I've got your thing. I think you're on. You're on the Discord app. We'll need to chat so I can send you something but yeah just look at the protein mitts or you if you have um like if your kid has orange in it or red the centini gloves that we have on our website will work great for you too because you put it on you forget that it's there and the padding is just where you need it and you can feel your bars it's not bulky as at all and that's why i like their stuff too centini makes really good stuff so you could look at centini.com or you try the Rafa stuff, but usually anywhere between 35 to 50 bucks or so will get you a nice pair of gloves. All right, let's see here. Um, for a remote fit, do I need to have an indoor trainer? Yes, sir, because we take out the guesswork. You need an indoor trainer. Uh, you, because I want you to ride. You will feel it. We'll be making changes, very subtle changes, and you will feel like it's going to be on the road. 
you you need an, you need an indoor trainer. When you go to the website, you'll see all the stuff in there, but I'll just run through it. Indoor trainer, you need a tape measure, preferably the ones, the metal tape measure, because it needs to be able to hold its position. And then you need one of those rulers. Uh, what's his name? Uh, <laughs> Jamal had the long one like I have, very long and with a, with a plumber's level in it. You can get that from Home Depot. And he also had the short one, like a one-foot ruler. But if you don't have the long one, the one-foot one will, 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 will do. We want at least 12 inches so it can cover the saddle, and you will put that under you when you're actually taking your measurement. But the long one makes it easier for you to see the bubble when, you, when you're taking your, your measurement. So if you go to our website, you will see a picture. I put a picture of Jamal there. You don't see his face, how he's using that ruler on this fit that we did today. Every time I do a remote fit, I, I do screenshots so I can see before and after with them. The reason you must have a trainer is there will be no surprise because what you feel while I'm watching you, I want to see you pedaling. That's when I can tell when things are off. And what you feel on the trainer is how it's going to feel on the road. So there'll be no guesswork. You can't do a fit without a trainer. Even the people that do Red Tool, you're basically sitting on some kind of a trainer from Red Tool that they paid twelve thousand dollars for that allows them to move the stem move you you're sitting and you're pedaling can't do it you ever try to do a fit without pedaling that's not a fit you're being ripped off you have to pedal so yes you need an indo trainer and if you're gonna ride seriously you really need an indo trainer so you're not dependent on the weather so when your schedule changes or you work late and you come home late you can ride anytime you feel like it yeah I, I haven't come across any serious cyclist that does not have some kind of an indoor trainer. Even back in the day when we had the crappy ones where you had to take off your front wheel, lock your fork in front, we still use that as a trainer. I like these ones that they have, the smaller ones now, because that one seemed like it put a lot of stress on the frame. But yeah, you need that. that that's critical. You can't, we can't use rollers. You can't use rollers for a fit. All right. <laughs> Christopher Roxbury said, if you have to ask for the price of an F12, you need to look for another bike. And he put a smiley face there. <laughs> you got to know the price, man. What are you talking about? You got to know before you put the money down. <laughs> ah, Chris. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Hello from St. Louis. Uh, he says, uh, I know you're feeling on disc brakes for the road, but with industry going that way, if buying new, does it make sense to go disc? I guess I probably should make another video about this break. I think I, I got I got I gave people the wrong impression. Well, maybe not. No, I just felt like it wasn't necessary. But I like the way he phrased the question. That says that he watched that video because what I was trying to get across in that video was if you already have a bike with rim brakes, and and let me diverge. Liege Bastogne Liege was wet. Several of the EF team guys have discs. Several of them have regular brakes. So it's like a matter of preference now. So yes, even though the industry is going that way, don't be fooled. You do have a choice. Your bike shop may be the one ordering the disc, but if you really want that bike, you can tell them, I want this bike with that brick. Unless it's a frame that was engineered to not work with that. Because I just, it's on the, in fact, it's on the Rafa site. They sent out, when they were advertising that jacket for the EF, that the EF team wore, He's on a brand new, I think they're using Cannondales. Brand new Cannondale, looks just like all the other guys, but he's got regular brakes on his bike. Uh, the wheel they were using, in fact, the wheel, I wrote the name of the wheel down on one of these things here because I was going to look it up. They have a, a particular model wheel, and it, it's shown on there. Let me see if, it, if I can find it here because um, I'm getting somewhere with that. Disc brakes are fine. But it shouldn't be the reason, you know, that's what I'm saying. It's like, it's not that big a deal for a road bike. So, yeah, if you really want a disc brake bike, then yes, get that. But don't think that you're stuck with it because they are, they're, they're providing both. Even for their pros. Uh, let me see. Shop what's new. Let's see new arrivals. So even for their pros, not all the teams have 100% discs. If you look closely, you will see what I'm talking about. Some of the pros prefer the regular uh, brakes, especially on their climbing bikes. 
I think it's because of the weight or whatever. And some people just that's what they like. So no, don't don't fall for that. Uh, they're available. It's just that if the bike shop orders the bike and specs it for disc, then that's what you'll see. But if you walk in there and say, I want that bike with these brakes, they'll get you one. <laughs> so yes, if you get a good deal instead, nothing's wrong with it. But you don't use it that much for it to be a big deal. That's really what I was getting at. You know, you're not going to be popular if you have strong brakes in the pack and you start using it. They'll be yelling at you. <laughs> So, if, yeah, because the discs have better modulation. You know, they don't get wet because your rims get wet and so forth. So if your brakes are really good and you start using them in the pack, you will not be popular. <laughs> so, yeah, let's see here. Um, so, yeah, so if you're buying new and you want to go to disc, look at it this way. If you already have a bike with the regular wheels and you have a lot of extra wheels, when you go to disc, it's a new investment now. Because your extra wheels will have to come with discs on them. So that means you can't use all those wheels you have. But if you're just starting out and it's your first bike or whatever, or you don't mind, or maybe you're going to sell those wheels. Because it's a new, it's almost like this This bike will need its own set of wheels and, and spare wheels. That's the way to look at it. And that's how I look at things. I got a bunch of wheels sitting around. So for me to switch, it will be like, man, you know, I can't just swap as easily. That, that's one thing, uh, but don't get me wrong. If, if somebody specced a bike and it had disc on it, I wouldn't frown on it. I would ride it, <laughs> you know? So, yeah, so let, let's be real. Nothing is wrong with them. They're okay. You know, we ride with people that have them, but then, yeah, it's not uh, it's not that that big a deal. So don't, don't sweat it too much, but don't feel like you're stuck. That's what I want to stress. They're, they're, they're available. But the market is not going that way. Both of them are available. Some manufacturers may design a bike that they don't want to put regular brakes on because they say, oh, the aerodynamic qualities or whatever, you know, some aero road bikes. And that's fine. There, there, there are certain cases like that. But a lot of the bikes can accommodate both of them. All right. DB says, I live in Brooklyn. He is right about RA cycles being expensive, but stock them for good sales. Yeah, RA is high. Their prices are high, but yes, they do have good sales. I've bought stuff from them uh, online. But yeah, the, the, if you open their, their web page and you open up Merlin or whatever and you find the same thing there, they're they're higher. You know, they're in New York. They got higher rents. I mean, you know, you pay $1,000 a month for some little small apartment in New York versus other places. So it's expensive up there. That's just this. But sometimes RA has stuff you can't find anywhere else. Abs, abs, as, as gem, I, it always makes sense going disc. I'm not sure what that means, but, you know, like I said, braking has never been a problem on the bicycle. <laughs> you know, so um, if, you're, if you're doing a cyclocross, yes, definitely go disc. Because you get muddy wheels and whatever, your braking is compromised. Uh, you know, but it's not that big a deal. That's what I mean. I'm just saying for the road, I don't we don't use the brakes that much. You guys see me drifting out in the wind to slow down. Nobody wants you braking because the guy behind you is gonna be coming up on you. So yeah, you you're not you're not you're taught to just feather your brakes in the pack if you do use it, not grab it. You don't do much modulating in the pack, so don't fall for that foolishness. There's nobody modulating their brakes in the pack because you see those pros when they crash, they just go down. It happens before you can do anything in, in so such cl close proximity. So on a road, in a road race, because a lot of times to avoid a crash, you got to steer. When something happens, you look for a way out. You see those pros jumping in the gutter or whatever. That's how you stop because the, the person's right there. The laws of physics, you're doing 22, 25 miles an hour, those little tires. You can't stop in such a short space because we're told to follow a foot or less. That's why it's not going to make a difference. So a lot of times, you guys remember a few years ago, a few years ago, uh, what's his name? Uh, Fabian Cancellara crashed. I think it was Pierre Roubaix. And everybody said, how, how did Sagan not fall? He didn't break. He rode over the guy's wheel and he was steering. He used his mountain biking skills. 
he steered around because you know the road was crappy, probably were bad in the, in the forest somewhere. But he did all of that. He avoided falling by steering away from it. And that's the way you have to think when you ride the road bike. So forget about what are we talking about discs. All of you guys, you're riding around on a cyclist. You always have to be thinking about getting out of obstacles. You know, and even in a car, sometimes something happens. Sometimes braking may not be the decision you need to make. You may need to accelerate out of there. You know, so just always be flexible. Don't depend on that. On the bicycle, no, nah, it's not that, that big a deal. But they look good. The new ones are really nice. So, yeah, you get a good deal on it, go for it. Let's see here. Um, Cardigan says he wants to know, could a cyclocross, that's a good question. He said, could a cyclocross bike be used as a dedicated road and gravel bike? I don't see why not. You know, and remember, who's coming up with these names for these bikes? You know, they got endurance bikes, cyclocross, gravel, whatever. If you look at the dimensions and the, there's still the diamond frame for the most part. So, yeah, you can take any bike, put the right tires on there, the right wheel, and ride it on those terrain. Because really what they're doing with the other bikes for, like, gravel and other things, they're giving you more clearance for wider tires, you know, to accommodate the surfaces you're going to ride on. A lot of the, the professionals, when they were getting ready for Paris Roubaix this year, they used, um, I forgot the name of the company. There was a wheel they used, but they used bigger tires. They used a 27 millimeter tire. So they used less pressure because of the cobblestones. So you could do the same thing with, the, with any bike that will take the tire. So nowadays, if you're buying a bike and you want to use for multiple purposes, like you're putting on there, just make sure it will accommodate a 25 or a 27 or even a 32. And then depending on what you want to do, maybe have a set of wheels set up for your crappiest roads and you put that on there and that'll be your gravel bike that day. You know, and then for the road, you go to a 25. Yeah, you don't need multiple frames necessarily unless you're really at the top level where you're specializing. So yes, because your fit will be the same even if you have multiple bikes. So yes, that's a yes. He said, would it be quick enough for the faster road rides with the wider tires or would two-wheel set be ideal? I think I answered that. Now, wider tires don't slow you down. If you have if you have a 32 on the bike, I ride 28s, 25s. They actually feel faster to me. Now, but if you have gravel-specific tires that are made for gravel on the road, yeah, because they'll have, probably have certain tread to it, you know, move the rocks around or whatever. So, yeah, we had a guy... Um, well, I wasn't with the group when he used to. And uh, before I joined UMC, a guy named Bob. Paul knows him. Bob found UMC. How how he hooked up with them? The story I heard was he was on a mountain bike, and a group of road riders, UMC guys, passed him, and he just sat on the back of that road group, you know, riding fast on his mountain bike, and he had sneakers on, according to them, and then he stayed with them for the rest of the ride. And that's how they, they invited him to start riding with them. So whether he had a road bike at the time, I, I'm not a, I'm not aware, but that's how. So there are a lot of riders that can keep up on their mountain bikes because if they have the right tires on there, that can, you know, some mountain bike, you can put a tire that will ride on road to, you know, not skinny tires. But people get hung up on the bike so much, unless you're doing a lot of climbing and stuff like that. But just on regular roads, you can pretty much roll with anything. You know, I roll my Conago. You know, it's not the lightest bike, but on the on the regular roads, it just rolls. So, yeah, you don't need to get too specialized on, unless you're trying to get into the competitive side. Then you can get specialized. So you can get one bike and commute on it, change the wheels, ride with the guy. People do that all the time. You can ride with the group on the weekends, change the wheels on the same frame, go to work on that bike. So yeah, don't don't you don't need a lot of bikes. You just need bikes that fit you, or, or a bike that fits you, and then you, you can use different wheels. So yeah, you're 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 thinking the right way. Eric, you're welcome. Eric, check it out. But yeah, try the Victoria, man. I think once in everybody's life, if you ride bikes, you need to ride a Victoria. <laughs> At least once. Verdell Jackson. Now, somebody did a, a, a super chat here. It just popped up. I didn't see a name. Thank you, whoever that was. 
Oh, it's Robert. Okay, Robert. Thank you, Robert. Okay, so uh, uh, let's see. Great content today. <laughs> Cycle Warrior says, can you talk about the Ray Tool Bike Fit software and how often you should get a fit? All right, I don't use Ray Tool, and I will tell you why. It's too expensive, first of all, and it's not necessary. Um, I, I've used the Fit Kit. When I was racing, I paid for a fit kit. That's how I got into fit. It's just funny how things worked out. I went to a bike shop because my coach didn't know anything about fit and because I, I was uncomfortable and I was fiddling around trying to just figure things out. And I went to a bike shop to get a, a fit kit. They put these pencils. They used to use two little pencils on the something you would step in, like attached to the pedals. And it's, oh, when the pencils are lined up, then your cleat is right. Nothing they did in the store. It was a bike shop in Austin called Freewheeling. They're no longer in business. Nothing they did in the store felt right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I, but you, you have to pay. One thing they do is when you go to do a fit, you don't pay after the fit. You pay before the fit. And I think I know why. <laughs> because it was like I felt like I was mugged. <laughs> Nothing worked. Okay? So all of these systems. And then Alan here had a red tooth fit, our buddy that we ride with, and he had to come back to me to tweak the red tooth fit. He paid some guy to put electrodes on him, all that crap. It still does not trump what you feel. So when I did Jamal's fit today, I looked at him. I, we, we got the numbers because we're doing everything by numbers, very scientific. We got everything laid out, and then I watched him. I watched the acceleration of his knee and all that, and I had him try different positions and whatever. Then I told him, I said, you look fine, but I can't feel for you. But then I told him what to look for. And then he came and he said, I'm being pinched when I get in. I had him try a particular position because I knew. If your balance is off, there are certain positions you can't tolerate. And when I put him in there, he starts scooting around. I said, ah, you're moving. And then he moved back. And I told him, okay, you move back. So that means you don't like where you're sitting. Then he started telling me about it was pinching his private areas. I said, well, you shouldn't, your perineum should not be touching the saddle because we got it level. But what was happening is he was sitting in a position that was too far forward than where he should have been sitting. So we moved the saddle forward three millimeters because he wasn't moving much. And I do three millimeters at a time. After we did that, he's, oh, this is fine, but I feel like we should still move it a little bit. So we did one millimeter. Now, what I'm getting at is, how do we know to do one millimeter? Because a lot of you who have tried it are only, you know what I'm getting at. We're going a little over, but that's fine. Today is, is moving. I like the topics. So we'll, we'll do that since we started late anyway. Anyway, what happens when you're doing it yourself and you don't know? The challenge is you loosen the bolt, you tap the saddle, then you might move it too far forward or whatever. So we don't loosen anything. I haven't measured before we loosen. And then you have to know exactly where you've measured because when you level the saddle, the length changes. As the saddle comes up, you gain a millimeter at least when it comes up. So you have to back that off. And that's what we did. Because So we didn't have to do a lot of trial and error. And he, then he confessed to me. He said, I would never have known to do that. There were things that I showed him on the remote fit. He said, I would never have guessed that. Or, or, you know, I said, well, I've been doing it for a long time. But basically in two tries, the saddle got to where all of a sudden I noticed his cadence is going up real crazy. And then he starts to hold the brick hoods on the side with his arm horizontal. And I just started to laugh and I said, I didn't even tell you to do that, but your body just went there. All of a sudden now he's using every part of the panel bars. And it was like, he, he was like an aha moment for him. He's all excited. So I told him to go there. Just Van Dick, thank you. Thanks for your contribution, your super chat. So basically what, what ends up happening is this. What ended up, what he discovered as we were going through it, he said he finally realized, and you know, uh, Jamal's been on here for a while, been coaching him for a while. He had a fit locally where he lives. Hey, Chris. Thank you, Chris. You guys are just, this is cool. You know, he, he had a fit where he lived, but then he wasn't happy with it. So when we did his fit today, he could tell the difference. God did a before and after. I don't change anything until we, we measured everything and I have a spreadsheet sitting with a program and we did a before and after. So he was three and a half centimeters too high. That's why his toes and feet were getting numb. 
So we lowered him, and all of a sudden now he felt like, oh, I can really get into the pedals. I said, yeah, you can reach them now. And then he said to me, I'm finally feeling like I'm sitting on my sit bones, the bones, the bottom of your hip back in there. Then I told him, I said, that's why the expensive shorts have the pad split because you don't need it in the middle. You need it on the side where your hips are. And it was just, you know, so what he told me was the fits he had done, they never explained what they were doing. They just did stuff. I don't do that. As we go, everything's being explained so you understand. It doesn't make you a bike fitter, but you understand why we're doing things and where we're headed so that when we get there, you will say, oh, yes, we've arrived. That's the way I do it. And even in the studio, that's what most show was talking about when he did his review. Uh, you explain everything. By explaining that to the person, they know what the, what the answer is supposed to be. So when they get that, they can recognize it. And he was just so excited. It was like his stem was pointing up like this, you know. So his shoulders, like we couldn't see his ears when we started. <laughs> he sat on the bike like this. I'm like, that looks painful. That takes energy. When we're done, you could see his neck. <laughs> So there's a lot of people out there doing fits the wrong way and just sending people out, not talking to them with this attitude like I know what I'm doing, as opposed to, you know, sharing the information with the person who's receiving that. You know, doctors do the same thing. You go there, they don't want to answer your questions. The same nonsense. But, uh, yeah, it, it's just uh, you don't need all those fancy things because even with those tools, the person wielding the red tool must be experienced enough to know how to adjust. The people that did Ray Tool is a base. They expect people with skill to tweak it. And a lot of these guys just want to depend on what that says. That's not enough. That's the problem with those fit kits and all that stuff. That's why Steve Hogg does not care for all that crap. That's the same stuff. He's like, it doesn't matter. If you give me a craftsman tool, it doesn't make me a master mechanic. <laughs> so, all right, let's see here. <laughs> Uh, uh, we we could talk about that fit stuff, Psycho Warriors, all day. I just wanted to touch on it a bit, even though I went on. So let's cover these and wrap this up. Raverman V versus BBB for break for bike lights. Which do you recommend for bike lights? I uh, definitely recommend Cycle Cy Light. Yeah, you don't want. Uh, yeah, that that's what I'm using now. I, I swear by them. Um. Let me see here. Let me get a link and put the link on here. Yeah, Saigo Light, they make, they make some serious lights. I can't tell you how many drivers have just commented on them. Every time I get out, they're like, it's something new with bikes. <laughs> like <laughs> they, they get noticed. Uh, I saw the Saigo Light on Moe's bike the first time, and I just, I once I tried it, just it's a busy light and it just it wakes them out of whatever is grabbing their attention. It makes them pay attention to you. So I and so any kind of flashing light, not just cycle light, I think just a flash red light on the bike, I think is a great idea because it's just uh people people don't pay attention and our, our vehicle is so thin they don't see us. And I think motorcyclists have the same problem. I don't think some of the car drivers are paying enough attention to see them. Um because it's like uh, they're looking for a, a, a you know a wide vehicle. I will put this uh, link here so you can look at it. That's these are the lights that I recommend. Any one of them will do. That's what I use. I only recommend things that I would use and have used and tested. So try those. All right, let's see here. Uh, Chris says I have my giant TCR custom sprayed. Looks amazing. Yeah, I saw the pictures. Most top ends frame are made by Giant. Specialized have never made a frame. They're just making. They're a marketing company. And they use Giant. I didn't know that. Okay. So cycle, uh, Chris Cycle War is asking whether the painting affected the warranty. I don't think that it. I don't think it should. We got a new patron, Andre. Just got an email here. Welcome, man. If you're on here, Andre Rice, R-E-I-S, 
Sounds European. Welcome. Um, yeah, it shouldn't, but well, you know, it's the split hair sometimes. I wouldn't worry about it. Okay, will road bikes end up with suspension? They've already tried that, Robert. Robert Tangler is asking what a road bike and uh back in the day when like Greg LeMond and all those guys used to ride Paris Roubaix, they put them on their bikes. Remember the rock shock and all of that? John Tomac used to ride mountain bikes. Those of you who followed back then, John Tomac was a top mountain bike rider. Uh, they, they, the road riders started using shocks on their front forks for Paris Roubaix. They did that for a few years and then it just kind of went away. It wasn't banned or anything. So I guess if you want it, yeah, you could mount it on there. You just have to buy the, 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 the fork. You can put it on your road bike. But it's been it's been done before. Not not mainstream, but the, the racers have done that. And um, yeah, so Chris just replied. He said they, they already do have them. They're out there. You just have to. You can spec it. You can you can change a fork on any bike. It's not a big deal to, to do. It's not a lot of work. So if you want to try that, yeah, you can. But for, you know, for for the surfaces we ride on, it's not that bad. And, and they did that, but I don't know why they stopped. And I guess they started using different fork rakes, and then they started using bigger tires. So the newer guys, they just go with bigger tires, you know, as a standard thing. All of them. Now they're not gonna they're not gonna put them as a standard, Robert, because the price will go up. So it'll be almost like they they might do it on a bike based on the price range, or offer it. And it's offered now. If you wanted it, you could put it on a road bike. They have them, but it, they're expensive compared to the regular forks. Oh, he said, like, how oh, you can't buy a wooden tennis racket anymore. Yeah, because they just don't make wooden tennis rackets. The technology has made the wood obsolete. <laughs> uh, yeah, nowadays uh, they've got so many different materials. From Malaysia, Barry, welcome. Jamal Griffin is here. That's the guy we did the fifth today, man. He looked like a pro rider, I'm telling you. He said, hey, my brother's sneaking the live in on my lunch hour. Well, good for you. <laughs> yeah, we did it this morning. That, that was really cool. Um, it was good to, to be able to do that. And, yeah, somebody just asked whether uh, they needed a trainer. Yeah, you need a trainer to do a fit. If you go to a studio, they'll put you on a trainer with your bike. But if, if you're doing it at home, you need a trainer. And I think every rider should have a trainer. Um, Michael Fernandez from the Land Down Under. Good morning and so it's already tomorrow there <laughs> chef kiwi who is that <laughs> all right let's see here <laughs> chris said the land down under arrived yeah it's tomorrow there that is really weird man that's cool so as Jam says, simply put, do a proper bike fit before you buy a new frame. Get the frame your body wants, not your ego. Yeah, well, really, uh, you don't need a bike fit before you buy a frame. What you need is a bike sizing. But, yeah, because, you know, the bike sizing costs a lot less than a bike fit. So let's say a bike fit might be 300 to 500 bucks. So I wouldn't advise you to spend 300 to 500 bu bucks just to get your size. Just pay for a sizing. It might be $99. So you know what bike size to shop for. Then when you get it, you need to be fitted. A lot of the shops offer that, but the problem is their fitters are not very good. You need to be very careful. Because you know, I, I felt like I was ripped off when I was racing when I went to do a fit kit. Jamal paid for a fit and he had to come to me to, to solve a problem he continued to have. When he went to his fitter and said, my foot's getting numb, the guy says, loosen the shoe. While he loosened the shoe, the problem didn't go away. The guy never came back with another solution. I don't like that. If the person has a problem, even if you're going to try different things, then go through the troubleshooting list. Imagine if you took your car to the shop and said, my car is idling rough. And then they change the fuel filter and your car is still idling rough, but then they hand it to you with a, with a bill. <laughs> The work's not done. <laughs> I hope that analogy works. <laughs> uh, that's, that's what I went through. A lot of people go through that. So people had complained here. That's why I made a video about how to select a fitter. 
it's in the archives. So you don't know what questions to ask if you're selecting a fitter because there is no certification that you can say, oh, at least they got a certain competency level. Yeah, you know. <laughs> okay. So Barry says, Barry Kuhn, Kuhn, I hope I pronounced that correctly. He says, I have a question. Does a 52T crank always outrun a 50T crank in a sprint? <laughs> I have a 52. Paul has a 50. So I would say no. Because the size of the crank, although the ratio is larger, the cadence matters. So if somebody spins, let's say I'm in a 52-12 and the person is in a 50-12 and they can spin at 140 RPMs and I can only do 90, they're going to kick my butt. So I hope that clears it up for you. Cadence is the, the bottom line, because that's what determines speed. So don't fall for that. You only run out of gears when you can't spin. All right. Let's see here. Wesley Steven. Ah, oh, blast. We haven't heard from you. Greetings. Haven't had a red tool fit. I can attest to what you're saying. In fact, the fitter suggested a smaller frame would be ideal for me. My current bike is 53. Thanks for the remote fit. Yeah, he and I worked on a remote fit. Um, yeah, it, it really has a lot to do with the expertise because that's just a tool. Red tool is just a tool. I mean, the name happen, happens to rhyme with tool. But red tool, fit kit, whatever. They're just tools. Somebody has to interpret them or use them. So don't, don't fall for that. Um... They're very expensive to get, so I don't understand why people will get them and then not learn how to interpret what they're saying so that they can maximize what the tool is giving them. But I'd much rather look at a rider and see them squirming and say, you don't like where you're sitting, and let that rider tell me, yeah, like, like Jamal told me, yeah, it's pinching me. No red tool can tell me that. And I told him, I said, yeah, I can't feel for you. All I can do is I can make sure the saddle will start at it being level and listen to you tell me whether it's comfortable or not and explain to you that you should be feeling. So what I told him was you should be feeling your sit bones, not the, the, your soft tissue touching anything. So when he said it was pinching, then he scooted back. I brought the saddle forward because that's where he wanted to be. Plus, the reason it was pinching, he was sitting a little further forward than he should have been. So once we placed him on the sweet spot of the saddle that I always talk about, it took the pinching away because now he's no longer sitting on that small part of the saddle. Because you really don't sit like you sit on a chair. Your, your bones are suspended. It's like you're perched. And then your legs just kind of like a fulcrum. You know, that's, it's hard to explain, but, you know, that's what I mean when I say you're in the saddle. And when you're in the drops, people can see the back of your saddle. That's the key. So let's see here. So um, so somebody replies, idea Barry, if the other factor is the same, the 52 out outruns the 50 always. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's kind of obvious. I think what he means is that if the 52... He, okay, for example, I, I'm going to qualify what he just typed on there. We're talking about a crank 52T. If I've got a 52T and I'm spinning at 100 RPMs, and you got a 50T and you're spinning at 100, and we both are in a 12, I'm going to be going faster than you. That's just the way it is. So to, to outrun me, you got to spin it faster. So you don't need a bigger cog necessarily for all the time. But you still need a reasonable selection in the back. So if all you have is like, like the junior, Greg LeMond used to talk about when he was a junior, he was restricted, I think, to a, I think it was 15. They didn't let the juniors use anything larger than a 15. I hope I've got that right. But because of that, he lost some races because there were older guys that he would, he would cat up to compete with, like John Howard and some of those other guys. So he would lose some races because... He just, he was limited by that 15. He'd spin it out. 
And then he wouldn't be able to, to beat those guys who were riding like a 52, you know, 13 back, back then. That's probably what was common. So, yes. But it, it's not just the size of the gear. It's that like whatever you're riding, you should be able to, to, to turn it. You can't just put it in a 12 and do like our buddy Victor does. You know, even somebody said, man, that looks painful. It does. And the funny thing, I hope, I don't know if I mentioned it. Victor is always telling us, I got to rest my knees. I got to rest my knees. He says that all the time. I have to say that's something normal. And Victor's a very stubborn guy because I've, I've already told him. I said, you need to use your gears better. He just won't hear me. But he, he does not hesitate to tell me, oh, I got to rest my knees. Well, the reason he's resting his knees is he's overloading his knees with those heavy gears. Thanks, DB. He's overloading his knees. So what happens is when you when you when your gears are too heavy, you can start pulling, hurting the connective tissue around your joints. That's just too much load. I don't care how perfect your fit is. At some point, you can overload the muscles too much based on the wind, the terrain, whatever. That's the reason we have shifters. So I don't understand, you know. So he tells us all that. Oh, I gotta rest my knee. I'm taking tomorrow off. Like we'll ride on a Saturday, and then we're coming back at the end of the ride, and he'll tell us, "Oh yeah, I'm not riding tomorrow. I gotta rest my knees." <laughs> I was just kind of laugh. So yeah, I always use that as a good example. All right, let's see here. Can you do a video? This is Chris Barron. Can you do a video on how to pack a bike in a bike case to travel abroad? <laughs> Come on, Chris. That's a tall order because there's so many different cases there. Um, I guess I have to come up with a concept because I got to do it for all the different cases. That, and the reason why, Chris, is some cases require that you remove the handlebars. Some cases don't. Uh, some of them may require that you remove the pedals, and some of them don't. So it depends on the case you have. But I guess what I could do is do a general thing to where I talk about how to make sure your positions are marked if you're going to take the bike apart, even if it's just a few pieces like the handlebars or whatever to travel. And uh, that way you make sure those things are marked, you know, as far as I would just call it like prepping the bike for travel because I can't cover every case out there. Um, a, a lot of a lot of the newer cases now require that you just twist the handlebar, that you don't remove them. A lot of them used to have you remove the seat post, you know. So I'll do some research and see what's out there and put that on the list. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Chris, great chat as always. Have a good. Yeah, take care, Chris. We're wrapping up. Sizing is fine at Danny, but geometry plays a huge part in comfort. Not every friend can be made comfortable for every guy. <laughs> so you got a problem. You got to start with the right frame. We've already addressed that here. When you get a when you get a bike sizing done, what happens is it's not just the height; it's also the angle of the seat. Because if if your body has if you have a long femur, then that means you need to sit further back. You need a shallow angle. All of that is part of. So when we say bike sizing, that's what we mean. All of that is factored because if you buy a bike that you simply cannot fit, meaning you can't get the saddle back far enough, you will never be comfortable. So, yes, that is part of the geometry. That's all. All fitters do that. So that's the reason it's good to know what you're buying before you get it, because some of the bikes, even if the height is right for you, the seat angle may be too aggressive. You guys look at my call Nago. I have a huge setback on it. Because it's 72.75. It's right at the limit. 73 is the limit. I can't sit on a bike that's more than 73. That's because that's what Colnago makes. They don't make anything shallower in that size. And I just wanted a Colnago. And that's that's the way it is. But you guys can see my custom frames. I don't have that problem. Because we put a 70 <laughs> seat angle. We put the seat tube back. And I could get my saddle comfortable. You know. And so the builders will build whatever you want. But yeah, but uh, a lot of places will do like a 71, 72. It's just lately they've been making a lot of 73 and a half and all of that. I don't know, you know. So I need a 73 or shallower to be able to fit it. Ian, thank you. We're going to wrap up here, guys. Great session. We went a little over, but I think it was warranted. We needed to kind of answer a lot of stuff. I want to thank all of you for all these super chats. DB. Charles Van Dyck, we appreciate it. 
You guys have a fabulous midweek and uh, we'll be in touch. Stay safe out there. <laughs> Paul Deckers, see you on the flip side. You're welcome, Michael. Take care, guys.